Welcome back to another isolation interview. Today I am joined with John from Warbringer on a very chaotic and wild hump day. How are you doing today, John? Uh, it's anything but chaotic or wild. I haven't left my house in days, and I am sitting on my porch. It is uh, the least chaotic disaster I've ever seen <laughs> from uh, my personal window of perspective. Is it a little bit weird to know you see so you know like a pandemic, know so much chaos is going on right now. However, you're at home, just in the backyard, along with everyone else. I know. T today, like, I, you know, I got up maybe 40 minutes ago because of why would I get up any earlier? And uh, yes. I went outside and I go like, ah, oh, what's that bright thing in the sky? What's it doing there? Shit. Yeah. You know, it's it's very strange uh, to be like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in like a permanent sleepover party with my wife. And the only thing we're doing is trying to figure out how to make tasty food out of everything in our fridge and you know we did the six hundred dollar shopping trip or whatever when this all started so now yeah. we actually got to use all that and you know there you go that uh, is so an it's intense been... shopping trip for six hundred dollars worth of good food so good job on that uh yeah go to go to whole foods you could eat for like three days on that right yes for one person <laughs> just one though so yeah oh whole man paycheck, yeah. It's, yeah exactly whole paycheck so there's so many cool things coming up for you, though, even though it's a time of sitting around and waiting. Because April 24th, we have Weapons of Tomorrow, the new Warbringer album. And we were talking a little bit about this, and I'm going to lead into the more questions I have about it. But Weapons of Tomorrow is another true um, war-esque style themed album, really talking about the not so much carnage, but just what the fight really is about. What's a good sales pitch you have for Weapons of Tomorrow, just the writing process that went through it? Oh, well, the, the sales pitch uh, I've been using is this is the 21st century state of the art for thrash metal, the new state of the art, yes. uh, the refinement of the science. So uh, that, that's kind of how we see it. Uh, we take a very analytical, almost scientific view towards our thrash metal, where it's uh, one common misconception I think people have about the genre is it's this narrow, creative straitjacket. When if you actually look at the canon of just classic 80s thrash metal, it's this really wide thing. Some of yeah. it's just on the border of new wave of british heavy metal emerging from that some of it's very punk rock leaning some of it's pointing towards uh black and death metal the stuff from 85 sounds way different from the stuff from 89 90 you got progressive leading stuff so warbringer pretty much tries to cover all those bases as well with uh with a 21st century retrospective where we, we can go into like you know mid 90s early 2000s extreme metal as well because uh we're able to look at all that and just kind of blend whatever we think uh might blend with the uh core classic thrash element in our mm. music do you have like some do you have specific influences from like the real heavy heat of the mid 80s where thrash was not only thriving it was excelling like in so many different levels and areas were well, there some of those influences specifically in weapons of tomorrow Oh, yeah. Well, in the band in general, uh, some of the core influences, apart from the obvious, like uh, Big Four stuff, which, you know, is, is indeed our Always, influences, yeah. um, is, uh, you know, you got stuff like Dark Angel, Darkness Descends, the first five creator records. Uh, vocally, I like Morbid Saint, Spectrum of Death a lot. Okay. Uh, first three, four, first three Sacrifice records from Canada. Razor, also from Canada. Uh, <laughs> Sodom, Destruction, uh Demolition Hammer, Epidemic of Violence in particular is a really important record. So those are, uh, oh, and uh, Old Sepultura when they, when they played fast. Um, you know, that, that kind of stuff is the core foundational stuff for the band. And I think in addition to that, there's uh, more than a little bit of uh, some early 90s death metal, you know, late 80s, early 90s death metal, death, pestilence, obituary, etc. cetera, okay. um, as well as... Uh, some like black metal stuff we like our bathory immortal dissection oh, and okay. uh, i think there's gotcha. a touch of uh, a touch of gothenburg riffing here and there in our band too some uh, some old in flames at the gates uh, etc you know you got the neapolitan ice cream of metal just with the chocolate vanilla and strawberry all yeah. kind of jammed in there that works yeah, well it, it works well because thrash is in the middle of all mm -hmm. of those things like yeah. just as far as an evolution perspective it's dead set in the middle and it shares a border with all of them so i think that what's different about warbringer compared to a lot of other recent thrash metal is that it pretty much touches all of it and so you have our songs where we're full blown in chaotic speed mode and then mm -hmm. other songs where we're you know borderline uh doing an iron maiden epic you know there we go uh, yeah. like like so uh i think that that uh, ability to pivot between styles is something that's kept us going and it's kept me creatively interested in the band quite frankly because mm -hmm. uh I, I wouldn't 
be otherwise. You Probably, I would just, eventually. You don't want to just do chugga 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 for eight minutes a song, and yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> you know, not to say we haven't had our share of chuggas. There's more than yes, a few but of you those do more than chuggas. A lot That's of what I meant by line. that. So yeah. yeah, yeah, I totally get what you got. You need your your weedly. Well, I always weedly weedlies and chugga chuggas. Yes. Well, you need your mixture of riffs, and yeah. there's three styles. So there's bludgeon riffs. That's your chugga chuggas. Then you need the riffs that slice, mm -hmm. like the the sharp ones, the that kind of shit. And then uh, the the ones that slash the you know slash and burn riffs. So you need your your bludgeon, your slice, and your slash, and then you have good thrash. Have you ever thought of going to Guitar Center <laughs> and teaching the violent th methods of guitar playing? Just like in a full horror style. Hey, you're oh. not you're not slicing nearly enough. That type of thing. <laughs> oh, dude, it would be the mo least useful guitar lesson ever. I, I don't, don't know. I don't know. I think totally you're doing it wrong, out. guy who knows how to play better than me. <laughs> <laughs> I think I honestly think people would sign up around the block for the horror, violent warfare style of guitar playing. So, just if yeah, well. or if you get really bored and you're stuck at home for the next couple months, we don't know how long this will be. Online guitar lessons through the methods of warfare could be a thing. You never know. Sure, just the methods of just yelling at you. Yes. Slice more. You're not slicing enough, dude. <laughs> <laughs> so other cool things was just with Weapons of Tomorrow. And just for everyone watching, if you scroll down to the pin comment, you can hear some of the songs coming from the new album that are already on YouTube that were released. So if you want to check out what's going to be coming on the new album for two of the songs, they're already down there. <laughs> And so for Weapons of Tomorrow, what were some of the biggest influences in writing some of the lyrics and just some of the material for this new album in 2020? Well, it's a mixture of things, as always. Uh, the band's overall uh, got a lot of Warfare theme, but I'd, I'll point out that there's actually two of ten songs on the record that have that, and that's okay. uh, pretty normal for us. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I, when I deal with Warfare, I, I tend to do from like a from space looking at the span of all human civilization i okay. tend to think from that angle a lot rather than the the, the that view mm -hmm. uh so i'll i'll do that for stuff like firepower kills it's about like the last hundred years of the evolution of weapons and kind of like it was already pretty nasty a hundred years ago and they haven't slacked in that time yeah so uh kind of just the asking that sinister question what's next you know that'll be real shiny and and new won't <laughs> it and the, there's kind of a scary implication there when you're talking about really advanced weapons yeah. um so other stuff though is apart from that kind of like big picture civilizational perspective which is sort of my hallmark uh there's actually a lot of intrapersonal themes on here on songs like uh defiance of fate which is sort of about the personal search for meaning and then unraveling which is uh is themed around suicide which kind of comes right after that other one so it's like the speaker of the previous song has failed in his search for meaning okay. and you get a, cru a crushing ending there so there's like a meta song tie-in uh, that theme is also explored in a more like literary manner on Notre Dame King of Fools, where the Quasimodo figure, you know, who's rejected by the world, is speaking as the first person speaker. And I have my coffee now. Fantastic. Okay, totally understand. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's uh, it's there's a lot of stuff there. Um, Heart of Darkness delves into kind of the ugly past of colonialism and how that echoes down the ages. There's a lot of echoes down the ages stuff with me. Um, <laughs> and uh, Outer Reaches is a straight up sci-fi. Uh, fantasy story I made up. So there's a wide range of stuff on there. And, yeah, it uh, sounds much more like um, layered than I would have anticipated. <laughs> so that's really intense too. Just like going like different aspects, both psychological, viewing from an outside looking in perspective, and things like that too, which is awesome. So yeah. yeah. So some other things coming up, hopefully, and I have optimism for this one. Is the Thrash Alliance tour hopefully at the end of this year for you guys? Well, they we announced it, so yeah. we expect that means that we're betting that this will be yeah. blown Opti over by yeah, exactly. November twenty eighth. Correct. So yes. I I fucking hope so because it would really suck to not. It already sucks to not tour till then. Sorry, I gotta go into my uh, still good. dark house to plug the phone in. You know how the battery goes You're from one hundred to ten, no time sometimes. So uh, yeah, but it's it's very odd uh, having to, like putting out a record and not touring on it. It kind of goes against every bone in my body yeah. because uh, Is this that's like, what if, you do. Are you like just like really have the itchy feet right now to try to promote this like in the way you know how, but you can't? Is it kind of like driving you a little bit insane? Yeah, basically, I should be. Uh, I should have shows coming up in a week or two. To be honest, yeah. uh, if not some things like already. Uh, as we speak, because we're, we're just shy of two weeks off from record release right now. Um, and that means that 
the band should be like out yeah. doing stuff. We, we were going to, I think we had a whole bunch of stuff. We were going to do a U.S. tour that wasn't ever announced because it was going to be in May. And it was one with, uh, I guess I'll say, another one of our peers that's putting out an album at about the same time, if that mm-hmm. narrows it down. Okay. Uh, yeah. Bummer and, uh, that that's okay. <laughs> yeah. That, so that didn't get announced. I think they're trying to put it towards the end of the year, but it's, it's honestly the, if you think of it about, about it from a booking agent's perspective, cause that's the one you actually need to consider here. Yeah. It's uh, it's pretty risky. If you, if I'm the agent or you're an agent, right. And you have a band and you're like, Oh, our band's putting out a record uh, in say April 24th. Mm-hmm. And, uh, how do you get that? How can you, when can you safely call that your band will be able to play a show? Mm -hmm. So right now what they're doing is they're like, let's stick it like six months out and fucking cross our fingers. That's what they're doing right now. Um, let's hope but yeah. nobody thought nobody saw this coming in the first place or not nobody but uh you know most <laughs> most people did not see this you and i you and yeah. i didn't we are just going about our business and right. we're not in the world health business right yeah. we're talking we're talking about heavy metal yeah. uh so it's uh it's a weird thing man and uh I think that uh, what, all I can really hope for this is that basically people buy the record anyway, that maybe everyone stuck at home needs a record, to a new record to listen to, and hopefully that'll – it won't get hurt too much by this damn thing because that would really suck for me. I put a lot of work into this record. My old band did. We, we wrote it over like – and recorded it over the span of like a year. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you, you know, and it represents ideas we had for the whole like three years before that so it's like a four-year chunk of my creative life in the band i really hope it it goes somewhere and does something because of the investment but uh it's just it's very risky and iffy and i have no idea what's going to happen so i really just got to cross my fingers hope for the support of the metal community and Mm -hmm. the people like the record and i got to believe in the record we made i think it's a hell of a record so uh you know hopefully other people do too yeah i mean it's coming through napalm on april 24th so the hype is still here it's still coming i mean the singles that have already been released people are really digging like you see the comments and stuff like that the people that are checking them out on the youtube pages and things like that so going back to like seeing like you're not really sure what's going to happen at least in the next six months or so do you feel like this is a weird time for warbringer because you guys are in this not a gray area. I guess this is good. Like all eyes are on you for the metal community because people are saying like, is it okay to release an album now? Because you're not the only band to have an album release now in this time. And they're like, there's so much trepidation and just not worry, but just not knowing what's going to happen this way. I feel like, I think the fans will search, you search it out for sure. Your label will search it out for sure. I mean, your label is reaching out to people for interviews like this and stuff like that, which is awesome. What do you think are positive ways you guys can also promote and like actually share Weapons of Tomorrow, your music? And that goes for other bands too. What are good ways you think you can actually get the word out there without touring, without being physically out on the road? Well, I'm doing part of it right now. Why True. do you think I'm here? Exactly. You know, um, <laughs> that, so that's one way. Basically, and, and as you point out, Napalm's had me. Every single day, I'm doing some kind of interview, Skype call, pre- uh, written, awesome. video, everything. So that's great. Uh, that makes me really happy. It lets me know the labels on it. Uh, our press personality is doing a phenomenal job, I think. Um, secondly, it lets me know that the interest is there. Mm-hmm. Every journalist I talk to means their outlet or them personally wanted to talk to War, you know, Warbringer. Um, so that's fantastic. Uh, and it's just great to like th- that's pretty much the main thing i've been doing because you can't actually go anywhere so i've been tr- you know trying to just do every interview that comes my way and uh it makes me it, you know it keeps me busy it's the one thing i've had to do recently mm-hmm. so that's been largely it we did something else which is pretty cool well first off i should let you know in two more days we're putting out a third single for the awesome. record okay so this record's getting more singles put out we might do a fourth after release uh, okay. Just to kind of have a lot of like YouTube content yeah. because uh, that's what people are going to be watching right now. So mm. we, we should supply it. We got a great record. We got a deep record, too. This isn't any like after the singles, it's filler. There is not there is no goddamn filler. That's what I want to hear. Good. That's awesome. right. No goddamn filler. <laughs> um, 
every song's its own idea and it mm-hmm. comes from its own place and it's its own unique thing that's the goal anyway so hopefully that and uh, we also actually made a in-depth docu-series about our own record that not only describes kind of the themes and ideas for every song because like you said it's, there's a lot of layered stuff on there so we wanted to really bring that to the forefront so we made a whole like 45 minute runtime documentary awesome. that we're calling the science of thrash yeah <laughs> and uh, awesome title yes i thought so yeah. i thought so so uh, <laughs> We're going to, yeah, and it's pretty much our process. So it's not just the songs themselves, but it's how we wrote them. So we break it down, like who's talking. We got the three main songwriters, myself, Carlos, and Adam on there. And whoever's talking in the sequence is like, first, Carlos wrote this riff. And then it went to key, to me, Keevil, to come up with the lyric. And then Adam came in to modify this or that about the riff. And we'll put it, uh, we put it on the screen in the sequence we actually wrote it. So it's like, in, you know, we tried to get the camera to go inside our brain as we're writing the record as well as we could. And I thought that was a cool type of content to have because it's not about some, like, you know, gimmicky thing. It's, it's the real nitty gritty details behind the record. And that's the kind of band I'd prefer to be is one that's about the songs, about the music. Um, so we tried to do media that's focused around that. So we're putting that out pretty soon awesome. in addition to the new single. So there's a ton coming out from us. And that's the one saving grace about this thing right now for us. <laughs> that cool. we have pl- At least we have plenty of material to release and we're not sitting on nothing. We have a yeah. whole new album, which is great. <laughs> that's awesome. It sounds like you like not overplanned, but you planned in depth like to make this something special. And now you can actually rest on that knowing that you have more than just what you already have shared out and the album itself. You have the docu-series or the documentary kind of The Science of Thrash. You have other things coming up for singles. You planned it out right. You did stuff. I, <laughs> Good we job. planned this before that happened, as it turns out. But yeah, it's. Uh, I'm glad we did. And uh, we, we got the first episode out that describes the Black Hand Reaches Out song from yeah. me, Adam Carlos. We're putting out another one for glorious in a couple days and then the whole thing is going to come out for the whole record i think on release so they're awesome. you know they're putting it into packets so they can release a lot of stuff because that's what that's what one does these days but it'll come up in like full version when the record's out and you can hear the whole thing and what i hope is it's a nice companion piece for the record we're on like your third listener so you're like i want to know more about this and you can watch that whole thing it'll it'll be like the same as like a netflix episode we, we kind of were aiming for that as like our template as like a net netflix docuseries kind of gotcha. episode yeah, <laughs> very cool. Hopefully not crazy like Tiger King, but Warbreaker. Uh, well, side. oh should... crap! Sorry, I didn't know you were going to uh, Tiger King cra- levels of crazy. <laughs> hey, actually, well, um, I mean, you know, we are a, he- a working heavy metal band. It's pretty strange. Nah, <laughs> we don't have uh, large cats or like you okay, know, w- abuses of workers or any of the or like a mysterious missing husband. I got sucked into it too. I'm the most anti-reality TV guy in the world, and mm-hmm. some people are just wacky and compelling. I was reading today though, for you know, because apparently this. Uh, guys become a bit of a hero around the internet apparently they had to cut out a lot of things he said uh that were uh, too spicy for the camera you know uh is too hot pretty for bad with, that's well, t- yeah yeah it's specifically like meth and racism apparently that that kind of hot if you will so not not the best stuff uh but so apparently you know just don't make these people your heroes like they're funny no. to watch on camera that doesn't mean they're good you yeah. know uh, and it's it's really sad that there isn't like a good answer for the cats. It, ultimately, the whole thing's really depressing. Yeah. I, my my wife's been watching it while I'm over here in my computer station, kind of like trying not to watch it and getting yeah. sucked in. That's what's been yeah. happening to me lately. <laughs> oh man, like I keep hearing stories too, like some of the animals were saved, taken to universities or hospital zoos and things like that. Some weren't. It's just a big mess. But it's like it's like I, worshiping a Jerry Springer character, you know, like. You don't don't do that. Don't yeah, do that. yeah. It's, no, no, and, and it's fine. It's like good that you know that the Jerry Springer characters exist, but they're like a cautionary tale. Yes, you yes. gotta be like, I have to value knowledge and critical thinking, so I don't end up that way. You know, <laughs> that's my yes. takeaway from it. Usually, <laughs> <laughs> treat this I as wanna... an anti how like how to episode. You know, like don't sure. do this. Yeah, there you go. Sure, sure. You know, you can be. <laughs> you know, I, I will give it to the guy is entertaining. Sure. Yeah. Entertain. No doubt. Yeah. Okay. That's <laughs> one, pos- one positive. One positive. There you go. Yeah. Uh, but I think kind of the whole thing that's wrong with our entire culture is that we give everything a pass if it's entertaining, and that's all we ask of anything. Like mm-hmm. politician. You know, yeah. fuck. It's I won't po- get it. It's into a political Wednesday either. today too, and it's just still a mess every single day. So. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's just, a lot. It, it is what it is. So one thing that we were talking about right before the call started, then we'll start wrapping things up. Because I know you got so many other stuff to do, like with Warbringer, like getting prepped for everything Friday. You have other interviews. Hey, more interviews today. That's I was going to say more <laughs> interviews. So yeah, one thing written I w- though, so they can take their. T- I can wait. Oh, long, okay, you know? fair enough. So one cool thing, like we were talking about, um, like we do these online, like we do these live, and I have several wireless devices. I was talking to you about Alexas and a laptop, all hooked up and things like that, and like I have to unplug them all when I'm doing this. And your instant thought was. I have a book you should not read. Okay, yeah. So that's uh, there's this lady called Shoshana Zuboff, who's a Harvard scholar, who kind of, uh, I was just watching her on YouTube talk for a while, and she wrote this book called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. And basically, it's a behind the look at your, your Facebook, Google, mm-hmm. Apple, Amazon, all the modern tech companies that are all really powerful in, in the current economy and world. You probably own their products, so do I, you know? Um, and th- there's just some, uh, you know, her tagline is like, you know, we thought we were searching Google, but Google was searching us. And there's cool stuff in there. Like she figured out exactly the, mo- you know, from internal Google memos is like mm-hmm. not conspiracy theory. This is scholarly d- documentation. Yeah. It's, it's not a this is a theory. This is a fact. So that's why I care about it. I don't mm-hmm. care about wild theories. I care about facts. Um, right. So. For instance, the Google Nest device, very similar to the Alexas that you have, uh, it has a microphone in it. But this microphone you will not find in the design schematics for the Google Nest. It's just another microphone there that isn't there on the blueprint that they give you or on the website or anything. But if you take it apart, there's a mic. Why? And the answer is... And uh, the answer behind a lot of things uh, like this, like, for instance, uh, Pokemon Go was a giant social experiment. Believe it or not, if you have Pokemon Go, if you use that, you were a willing guinea pig. Uh, the game was like the mouse trap, to use an analogy. The mm-hmm. game was the mouse trap to get you, the mouse, to go and give them the, your metadata. Um, and, and what metadata is, is like stuff that you or I wouldn't even notice, like when you brush your teeth and how much and what you eat when and and like really basic just like almost data exhaust they call it of what you do and that that can actually predict way more about you than you think it possibly could and it's actually really financially valuable and so that's why it's being sold on a mass scale it's not the government watching you it's businesses because if they watch everything they do they can figure out exactly what to sell you this is how when you like turn on youtube you're like i was just talking about a couch and then there's a couch there yeah. you know it's it's actually your metadata that that does that um because that's how powerful its predictive power is and it's, it's a little counterintuitive and weird but it, it turns out to be true here's an example of that and i'm just quoting this lady right now basically um so there was and i told you this one before i'll tell it yeah, no everyone should hear this is good Th- this this one's good yeah. um so there was a girl who is shopping on Amazon, and based on her changing the shampoo she bought, the algorithm knew she was pregnant before she did. She was. And it started sending pregnancy product ads to her dad. And that's how she found out she was pregnant. How did it know this? Well, so this girl changes her shampoo, and the algorithm knows. It is programmed to know, because this is a fact, that uh, pregnant women, change their sense of smell and what they want, changes so it knows that and it knows how it knows what smells become appealing and it's not any smell it's specific a set of ones so because of the type of shampoo she changed from and to just that alone one purchase the algorithm knew she was pregnant she didn't her dad didn't it let her dad know you know just by recommending him useful products uh you know like a breast pump or whatever yeah exactly uh, and how so, awkward is that brutal, dad gonna be brutal. when he goes you have something to explain to me and holds up a shampoo bottle and that's how the discussion has to start they, they wouldn't know it's the shampoo bottle they wouldn't Ugh. know the algorithm knows that's what they figured out after when they like get mad at the company and are like why the fuck is your algorithm telling my daughter that she's, she's pregnant, pregnant before she knows you know that's like, if i was a dad i'd be like what the hell are you what the fuck kind of how, shit are you doing yeah, you know how dare you accuse my daughter of that yeah stuff I, 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 and it was right yeah, oh. know, <laughs> still that's not the point how dare you accuse my yeah. daughter that's no it's brutal now. man it's brutal and, and just the fact that uh like 
that an algorithm could know more about you than you do mm -hmm. is because that algorithm has way more computing power than your limited monkey brain, basically. Uh, you know, sorry to be rude. Mine too. No, you know, mine. I'm no that's, that's accurate. I've been, I've you been know, it, no, it's about. accurate for everyone. We mm -hmm. don't like to think that we like to think we're smart. We like to think we know everything, but we don't. It's a fact. Yeah. And uh, the problem is algorithms and AI is getting better than us. There's this program AlphaGo that beat what Go is a really complex. Uh, think of it like chess, but it's more complex. It's a Korean board game. Mm -hmm. It's like long known as a test of the mind and strategy itself. It has a quasi spiritual component. They built a computer that built that beat the best guy in the world. This right. is like beyond Deep Blue in the '90s. This is a whole nother level because you can't just uh, you can't brute force go. It's more complex than that. So it has to actually do strategic thinking, and it can, and it won. Yeah. <laughs> oh, ow. Yeah. So. That's uh, uh, that's you know we're we're getting into this weird Skynet world and it's not even the property of sci-fi movies or guys who write evil metal songs anymore. It's just oh shit, that's fact. Mm -hmm. So that really actually kind of that kind of stuff drives me to write more music like what we're writing. It's very anti. Uh, this music is very anti the current progression of society. I think there's got to be a better way to have our futuristic world where technology can be a tool of liberation and empowerment for the masses and not of subjugation. So th that's kind of, uh, and you'll see this in a bit, a couple Warbringer songs. There's one called Hunter Seeker from like seven years ago that was about this. And it was right after the Edward Snowden thing, oh. uh, which is kind of the, the tip of the iceberg as it turns out. So that yeah. was only the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, that was just, I was you just kind of answered my last question. It's like, is this a part of weapons of tomorrow? Is the use of metadata and like like sneakily finding different facts and using them to curtail what you think you want and what your bot you think the I guess the target is a good way to put it. Whether that's the target as a customer or something else, do you think that's going to be a weapon of tomorrow, uh, either eventually or if it is already? Well, well, Hunter Seeker's not on this record, but uh, I'd say this falls under, on this record, there's this one crush beneath the tracks that's really about the AI automation, kind of people becoming obsolete as machines are mm -hmm. now better than them, and well, what do you need you for, you know? Uh, this is a line with steel is so strong, flesh is obsolete. It's kind of about that progression of nice. machines getting better than humans at being humans, um, uh -huh. and sort of... Yeah, it, it's an ugly future, you know. It is, no, if, it's if, very if, true, though. I'm not. You can't if, argue it. No, well, you, you could, but it's like well. if you want to be vigilant and safeguard a better future, if you want to have like kids ever and not have that be a crime to them, you, you got to do stuff to make the future better. And uh, one of the things that uh, is pointed out about all the surveillance right now it's being used basically to sell you stuff and make money however it's that exact same technology my thought is if you could give that to uh, some of the 20th century totalitarian secret police if you gave if you gave that kind of metadata searching potential to the gestapo or the nkvd or the stasi or something that would be horrible beyond belief you could imagine those guys just being like yes we'll know everything <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just it's terrifying because yeah. you know, that's just last century. That's not that long ago. That's two generations back that you got that kind of stuff. Uh, less in the case of, uh, you know, communist East Germany and the Stasi. That's like, you know, my birth time, the time of my birth. So that's it's really not hard to see that a minor change with things and it could be used in this horrible way and to be honest in china they are using it that way currently hmm. uh you, can, you know that's that's another thing it's a very different um, world than we live in like or, well from country to country i guess i should say but still it's a very different like, yeah and, and, and yeah. universal universal human rights are are that so that's something i i'm a humanitarian so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a guy who writes about evil and studies totalitarians and warfare i'm a firm pacifist humanitarian that's there my belief go. you know i've i've so it's uh i'm very much the opposite of what i portray in my music my music's meant to be kind of embodying the voice of evil if that makes sense and in a way that's kind of a protest for it. it's evil from its own perspective and i think being able to understand evil from its own perspective is very important if you actually want to fight it okay very good like trying to like warning signs through slashing bludgeoning and, <laughs> and slicing. Slicing. slicing slicing there yeah. we go See, i'm, yeah, still, that, learning. That's I'm like... still learning my guitar so uh, there you go. Well, and now your lesson's complete, and you yes. should be able to both. Uh, you should be able to make all the thrash riffs of the world. You got to bludgeon, slice, and slash. It was much easier uh, than I thought it'd be. Thank you.
No, it's just three things, man. You just get a good balance, and if you've been bludgeoning for a while, now you better slice, you know, and then then you slash after that. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, if, if one song's mostly bludgeon, then you put a slicer or a slasher after the bludgeoner. There you know, go. Crush Beneath the Tracks is a bludgeoner for sure, but, like, Firepower Kills is more of a slasher. I should be taking notes. Dang yeah, it. yeah, see? <laughs> so, so many cool things coming to you. April 24th, Weapons of Tomorrow is coming out through Napalm. I know, and I hope, that we'll see more new stuff from you coming, whether that's on the road or just, like, surprises, whatever you have in the next few months, too. If there's any message you want to say to everyone watching this, because after the live stream's over, it just goes up as a regular video, so whoever watches okay. this after. Anything, any type of message you want to get out to everyone, the time is yours. Well, it's it's not if we tour, it's when. Okay. We will get out there. We will tour this record. And we will kick asses. God damn it. We are resolute in this. In the meantime, check out uh, the band in general if you haven't heard it and uh, the new record. We think it's one hell of a record. We put a, a you know blood, sweat, and tears into this. And we tried to make, uh, I'll say it again, 21st century state-of-the-art thrash metal for you guys. We really hope you enjoy it. Um, and, you know, what more can I say? We made you the best metal we can, and that's what it's ultimately about. That's why we're here. That's awesome. So, Weapons of Tomorrow, The Science of Thrash, and John's Guitar Skills. All things you can check out. <laughs> I wrote a uh, fun thing, and it is in The Science of Thrash, but I wrote one of the songs on guitar, and I don't play guitar. Huh. I guess you'd be this in butthead style. No, no, there Firepower Kills. I wrote the main riffs in Firepower Kills because it started as the vocals. It turned out as the opening track. But. There you go. 